Welcome to today's homeowner with Danny Lipford. Expert advice on improving your home from the pages of today's homeowner magazine and remodeling contractor Danny Lipford. Well, we have a little bit of a different show for you this week. We're in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour south of Philadelphia. Now, this town of 5,000 was founded back in the early 1700s, and around 1896, a group of local farmers started growing mushrooms. Today, it's the mushroom growing capital of the world. Now, we're here to show you a very unique home. It's about 100 years old, but about 20 years ago, they divided this nice home into a duplex. Well, the renovation project involves turning it back into a single family dwelling. We'll show you that here in Kennett Square, so don't go away. Well, welcome back. You know, one of the great things about buying an older home, you also get some older landscaping in the yard, so, such as the case with this lot with the nice established maple trees, hemlock trees here on either side of the sidewalk, and really creates a perfect setting for this home. Now, this home was built about 100 years ago, and the entire exterior has a granite covering on it that was mined from a quarry down in Maryland. Now over the years, unfortunately, with the conversion of the house to a duplex, a number of things changed on the exterior. One of the most unfortunate ones is the front door, the main entry to the house, was sealed off and that space was used to create a bathroom for one of the downstairs apartments. That created the need for entrances on either side with some landings on it that really don't justify the look of this house. Another thing that's not original to the house is the porch flooring. When this porch flooring was replaced about 20 years ago, the contractor really made a big mistake. You can see the rise here is almost 11 inches, well above the standards of most codes. Codes usually dictate around seven or seven and a half inch rise as the original steps are. And it is unfortunate because someone spent a lot of time on putting this treated porch down. You can see how careful they were to cut the ends of the board all along to adapt right to the contours of the granite. I'm sure they spent a lot of time and probably burned up a number of jigsaw blades in the process. As I mentioned, they closed the entryway, the original entry of the house off to create a space for a bathroom. And in the process, they completely destroyed the original door by installing this inexpensive aluminum window. It is unfortunate because the homeowners will have to purchase a new door when they create the new entryway into that. But a lot of the original features are still in place, including all of the shutters on the exterior of the house. They're in bad need of a nice paint job, so the homeowners plan on doing a good bit of this themselves and stripping this down to bare wood and priming it and painting it like it should. But there is a lot of great craftsmanship on the outside of this house, including all of the masonry work here from the granite pieces, even though a little bit of pointing up here and there, like the cracks here, will have to be done to keep water and snow and ice from getting down in there and causing some damage there. Another challenge they have is how to improve this ugly area of the house where the asphalt parking lot had to be installed as a requirement when it was converted to a duplex. Now, it's a fairly large house, three stories and a basement, and the homeowners plan on using the basement for a lot of storage. But they've got a problem there with water intrusion, and I think we found that problem. Well, there's just asphalt everywhere, even here in the back of the house, and it's creating quite a drainage problem. Actually, the asphalt in this area is a good bit higher than the basement window, so anytime you have melting snow or rain, it's flowing right against this wall and getting in the foundation wall and around the window. Now, the homeowners will be removing all of this asphalt later on in their landscaping plans and grading the dirt away from the house so that the water will run away from the foundation. Now, whether you have a basement in your home or just a regular slab home, you need to keep that water away from your foundation. It can cause a lot of problems, and in this case, water in the basement. Now, stay with us after the Simple Solution segment. We'll be back and show you more about this unique house here in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. Get ready to review your fix-it list as Danny and today's Homeowner Magazine Repair and Maintenance Editor Joe Truini show you this week's simple solution. Brought to you by Dodge. 
Now, a big problem we have when we're remodeling the interior of a house, so many times the homeowner won't remember what brand or color they use in a particular room. It's really a challenge trying to match that paint. We found a great way to solve that problem. We're going to leave ourselves a little reminder right here in the room for future reference. We're going to start by tearing off a small strip of masking tape and placing it on the back of the switch plate cover. Then we're going to record the paint name, color, and number onto the back of the tape, onto the back of the switch plate right on the tape. Now when you're getting paint like this, normally if it's a custom color, they'll have that information somewhere on the can, usually a label attached to the top of the can. If it's a stock color, you usually can find it right on the face of the can itself. You can also get the paint store to print you up a second label, which you can put right onto the back of the switch plate, makes it even easier to remember the paint color. And if it's wallpaper in a particular room, you can record that same wallpaper information on a piece of masking tape. That way, the next time you're taking on a remodeling project, it'll make it go a lot easier. I can see where it'll make a big difference there. I'm with Art McEwen of Art McEwen Construction, who's handling this very interesting remodeling project. And Art, I usually don't carry a drafting table out on my jobs. Well, Danny, we don't either, but a lot of times we'll, we'll set up a piece of plywood or something just so it's easier to do exactly what we're doing here. We're lucky enough where the owner is a landscape architect. Okay, great. It's real convenient. Now, I know you're converting this house from a duplex into a single-family dwelling, which is just the opposite of what we usually do in reluctantly building walls to divide up a nice big house. But uh, what are some of the changes here that you're doing in order to get it back to that single-family dwelling? It is interesting because usually we do the opposite. And on this project, we're going we're gonna to take down the wall from the stair to the foyer, which is here. And also, the old office area or bedroom, as they used it, where we'd be removing that wall. We found some interesting things right in this area that were original to the home. And whoever did the work took care to save some of these items. And then, of course, the wall right behind us here, which has a door and the old chestnut trim. We're going to remove everything but the original trim. They're kind enough to leave us this trim so we could restore it to its original nature. Well, it looks great. And I understand that that was used quite a bit back during the turn of the century. Turn of the century and until the chestnut blight, and then they changed different materials. I see. Well, I hear the guys out there working on the hallway, and I want to find some of those architectural details out here. Well, they are moving along here real well. Hey, you sure are, Danny. And the next thing we're going to do is open this old shelving area up, which wasn't built to the best of standards, but we're going to make that opening, that cased opening, sort of look like this cased opening over here, where that was the original chestnut and pediment again. And this is kind of neat. You have the old radiused pilaster made out of plaster, which one of our challenges is going to be to radius a piece of baseboard trim and the crown molding around this point here. That's always fun to do. Oh, I'll tell you, wood won't bend very easy, and it uh, can get expensive doing something like that. Absolutely. And talk about radiuses. Uh -huh. Look at what we have here. We have the old radius landing where they built a temporary landing, if you will, for the last 10 years, which we'll remove, and we hope to find another riser and tread underneath this. Well, that'll be great. You know, and this really opens it up a lot better to the foyer than having that wall across there and winding down. That's, that's really going to make a big improvement. It opens everything up so much you can use a fireplace. Yeah, a fireplace in the foyer. What's that? Isn't that nice? That old brick, probably from down south in Merlin somewhere or, or up north in Allentown. And it's, it's really nice to, you know, warm up your foyer big enough to have some furniture in. Sure, sure. And so many openings along here, you'll be able to get some heat into some of these other rooms as well. That's right. Mm -hmm. And one other thing we're doing down here is the entrance to the old ante area, which is now a powder room, disguises the old stairway. They actually sit under a laboratory. Oh, I see. Well, so we're going to expose that and try and recondition the trim on the outside. Hmm. Well, I know you're doing some more up on the yeah, second floor. Yeah, come on up. I'll show okay. you. Danny, on the second floor, we're going to do some of the similar work that we did on the first floor, removing walls and that. Okay. Well, you know, the staircase is in great shape, other than, I guess, a couple missing newel caps there. We're going to handcraft the newel posts to replace them. Sometimes people take these as a memento. Some of the other interesting items are the stained glass and, of course, the bench. You can take a break on the way up. Yeah, probably need to with all these stairs you yeah. have here. Now, this is something that I noticed earlier that uh, certainly is not an authentic looking thing. Well, the difference in code between single family and duplex is that now we don't need the emergency lighting, the exit sign, 
and this wall over here, that's a one hour fire rating assembly. Okay, all a metal door and that's yeah, what it's thing. a labeled door, you have drywall on both sides and glass that it takes an hour to burn through. Yeah, real commercial looking though. It sure is. <laughs> now I know with the duplex you've had, you have two kitchens here, one here and then the one on the downstairs area. What are the plans for that? Well, the, the owners, Paul and Carol, are gonna replace their kitchen downstairs. When they do that, they have a place to eat, relax, stay away from the dust. And it's not unusual in this area of the country to have two kitchens. In the old days, they used to cook pasta on the first floor. I see, well, great. Well, well, you know, it'll certainly be more convenient when the kitchen remodeling takes place for them to have a place because you know how it is with kitchen remodeling. Either the homeowners are gonna be inconvenienced or they have to eat out a lot. Uh, what about the third level? Well, on the third level, we have a few things to do. We have some replacement windows that are going to be egress windows so they can get out in case of fire, mm -hmm. and also some cosmetic and a few other little things to do. Great. All right. Another issue is the possibility of lead paint in a house of this age. When we come back, we'll talk with a lead paint expert. It's time to check out this week's best new product with Danny and today's Homeowner Magazine Editor-in-Chief, Paul Spring. Brought to you by The Home Depot. Carpenters are always looking for ways to save steps and save time during the rough carpentry stages. And this week's best new product really accomplishes that very thing. This is Louisiana Pacific's Visual Precision. It's a 7 16 inch oriented strand border OSB sheathing. Now, as you can see, it looks a little strange because it has one inch grid marked across the entire board and along each of the long edges is what amounts to a ruler. Now the way this really saves you time is when you have a piece of wood like this up on your sawhorse preparing to make a cut, normally you'd have to take your ruler, make a mark, make another mark, use your chalk box to create the line, then you're able to cut it. Well here, you have your ruler in place, you have your cut line in place, and it really saves you time during that stage. Then the next time saving is when you're actually installing it. You put it up in place, measure to that first stud, drive a nail, and after that, no more transferring or measuring over for your next stud or next joist. In this case, you just count the boxes or follow up along the ruler and nail right on down throughout the rest of the board. And if you're using this sheathing for exterior sheathing, say on the side of a garage, and you're putting lap siding on, this will serve as your guideline to keep the lap siding nice and level, particularly if you put the piece of wood on nice and level at the start. And up on the roof decking, it gives you a guideline for all of the felt before you put your shingles on. You know, this is one of those products where Danny and I look at it, and then we look at each other and say, how come somebody didn't do this before? Now, if your house was built in 1978 or before, you may need to be concerned whether there's lead in your home. Now, a couple of years ago, the federal government started requiring contractors and remodelers to provide this brochure to homeowners that are undertaking a remodeling project. Protect your family from lead in your home. Also, the contractor's required to have the homeowner sign an acknowledgement statement saying that they did receive this brochure. Now, this is a federal law, so if you're asked to sign this form, don't be surprised. And to find out if you have lead in your home, we'll talk with an expert. Well, Lee, I see you're playing with your ray gun again. Hey, Danny. This is Lee Wasserman, who is a licensed lead expert, and I know this instrument must be just invaluable to you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is a... Uh, Field portable x-ray fluorescence lead paint analyzer. It's a quantitative analytical instrument. It's non-destructive. Um, what we do with it is we actually we hold it up to a painted surface. I depress the trigger. And what it actually does is it throws out some low-level radiation, excites the lead electrons. And quantitatively, the instrument uh, gets the quantity of lead back, gives me the actual measurement. I can tell how much lead is in the paint. I record it on my field sheets. All goes back to the office, ends up in a report, gives me a statistical blueprint of where there is or isn't lead paint in this property. Oh, I'm fairly technical there. Yeah, it's pretty technical <laughs> stuff. Now, about homeowners and what are some of the things that, how do they approach a situation like this? When you're doing a remodeling project on an older home like that, what are some of the first steps? Well, the first step certainly is to find out, do I or don't I have lead-based paint on the components that you're going to be disturbing? And that's where this type of instrumentation comes in very handy. Okay, what about other tests other than this? Well, there's two other type of ways that we could determine if there's lead in the paint. We could actually take a physical bulk chip sample where we actually remove some of the paint. We send it off to a laboratory. Once again, it's a quantitative test, gives me a number. I can compare it to the regulatory action levels, but it is destructive. The other type of methodology we can use is a chemical test. They can turn either pinkish in color or blackish in color, depending on whether or not there's lead paint. 
Uh, it is a qualitative test, so I can't compare it to the regulatory action levels. And once again, it's destructive. We try not to use it too often uh, because we don't like disturbing the surface, and we like to have a quantitative measurement. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. Now, I assume in your report to the homeowners, you're going to make some suggestions on if you have found any lead or presence of lead mm -hmm. on how to handle the problem. Always. The back of our report is an appendix. It gives the general categories. We can either suggest a removal and replacement situation. We could suggest enclosure, locking it down, encapsulation where we actually paint over it with an epoxy, or some type of stripping method. Okay. Now many of the articles that I've read about lead talk about the dust and how that can really be a problem, especially with smaller children. Uh, how do you analyze if there's a lead dust problem in a home? You know, I'm glad you asked because I was just getting ready to do one in the other room. Okay, great. All right. Hey Danny, why don't we take the dust wipe right over here? It's a uh, probably the least likely area to be wiped down or to uh, be uh, cleaned off. There's a reason, I guess two reasons why we would take a dust wipe sample. One is to find out what are the pre-existing dust levels of lead in the property. And the second reason is always at the end of a renovation remodeling project to find out if the house has uh, met the clearance standards and that someone's not walking back into an environmentally potentially hazardous situation. Well, why the tape? Why are you defining an area? The tape uh, gives me a templated area because the clearance standard is in a unit of measurement of square foot. I see. So I template out an area, then I put my uh, disposable latex non-powdered sterile glove on. I take out one of my uh, baby wipes here. It's pretty much a baby wipe. It's a sterilized gauze. Oops, I gotta be able to get one right there. Okay. okay. Then what I do is almost in like a snow plow fashion, I wipe the area down in such a fashion. Once I get it, I fold it in half. I go in the opposite direction. So I capture all the dust in the templated area. I roll it again in half. I wrap it up. I put it inside a sterilized tube, I fill out my chain of custody, I package it up, I send it off to the laboratory, and by tomorrow afternoon I'll know whether or not this floor has an acceptable or unacceptable level of lead dust. Now let's go outside for Around the Yard with Danny and lawn and garden expert Jennifer Brennan. No matter what part of the country you live in, you're probably battling weeds like most homeowners. And the secret and most important thing about weeds is to get rid of them before they go into flower and before they produce seed, otherwise you'll fight them for five years. You want to remove the top part of the plant and you also want to remove the roots because even leaving small minute parts of roots can enable that plant to come back. Now it looks like you have a tool there that can handle that very thing. There are many great tools out there. I like this one because it's multifunctional. You've got the prying tip right here that can dig in and pull that plant out with root included or you've got a cutting edge where you can cut it off below the soil level and if you do that frequently enough it depletes the root and they won't come back. Now what about putting any of the old weeds in your compost pile? You need to do one trick and you need to leave them laying out on a sidewalk overnight so that they dry out. If the roots dry then that plant is dead and it can't come back to life in the compost pile. Okay well hopefully some of these tips will help you if you have weeds around your house. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's show here in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, and I hope some of the information that we gave you about lead detection in your home will be helpful. You know, whether you have a historic house like this or just one built before 1978, you may want to have your home tested just so that you have that good peace of mind for your family's safety. Now, join us next week when we're back here in Kennett Square talking with the contractor about some of the progress he's making and talking with the homeowner about some of the ideas she has for her home. We'll see you next week.